So please welcome Randy for this year's this week. Yeah. Well, thank you everybody for coming to this talk right before spring break. I really appreciate it. And um, so, you know, following Paul's lead at the beginning of the semester, um, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about some recent and ongoing projects. And um, many of you might know that I'm, you know, I, I would call myself a vertebrate paleontologist, but, um, you know, uh, sadly for you, there's no fossils in this talk. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but hopefully you'll still find it compelling. Um, the first thing is I just want to really emphasize everything in this talk as with all the research I'm involved with is truly co collaborative with uh, students and colleagues across the globe. And so I want to really emphasize that I'm just the one talking about it today, but um, just a small part of a huge team effort for a lot of this work. So what's the motivation here? I'm interested in testing hypotheses about the evolution of ecosystems and their environments in deep time. And uh, that sometimes involves the age of dinosaurs, sometimes other places. Um, but to do that, uh, we need to make sure that the inferences we're making are robust. Now, that doesn't mean that they're true, right? Because um, most of our research conclusions, you know, 100 years from now will be shown to be false, but it means that we're making the best inferences we can based on the data we have available. And so in the end, I've sort of sometimes it's a bit depressing, but I feel like a lot of my research uh, has sort of gone towards understanding what are the limits of those inferences and where are we over interpreting or under interpreting our data. Um, in deep time when it comes to both evolution of ecosystems and their context. So I'm going to talk about sort of two themes in this talk. One is surround is related to geochronology, um, and one is related to paleo environment and a bit of stable isotopes. So hopefully I don't need to convince you that geochronology being able to tell time in the geologic record is essential, but this is just an example from my favorite time period, the Triassic. I've got you know, the three divisions of the Triassic period with some different biotic events, including the first dinosaurs here. And you might look at this without a time scale and say, oh, well, the first dinosaurs appeared about a third, uh, two thirds of the way through the Triassic period. But if we actually are able to put some ages to this, we see that there's a big difference, right? So uh, it turns out the late Triassic is actually half of the entire Triassic period, if not more. And so the first dinosaurs actually appeared about midway through the Triassic period. So geochronology can really change our understanding of the sequence and timing of events relative to when we just have a relative dating techniques. And it can fundamentally change ages themselves, so as well as correlation between different study areas. So here's two different formations, one from Argentina and one from the Western US. And in the past, biostratigraphy suggested that they were roughly equivalent in time. But with uranium-led ge geochronology, uh, we've actually seen that one of these is almost completely younger than the other in time. And so it's totally changed how we then interpret the patterns we're seeing between these two different formations. Um, having absolute ages is also really critical for other geochronologic techniques like magnetostratigraphy, right? You have these wonderful, really dense changes in magnetic polarity in a sequence, but how do you know how to correlate them without being able to put some ages on them, right? There, it's not always clear exactly how these barcodes correlate. Um, and so as a result, particularly with the evolution of analytical techniques, geochronology, particularly radioisotopic dating, has exploded in the last two decades. So this looks like a linear plot, but note that the y-axis is a log scale. And so we are just producing more and more radioisotopic ages. Um, this is just uranium lead ages. And if you added in argon, argon and other techniques, it, I'm sure it would still look about the same. But the point is, as is often the case, we're pr often producing data much faster than we can properly interpret it. So the ability to date stuff is ahead of our ability to really do a careful job of interpreting it. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about in the first part of this talk. Um, before we do that, 
Uh, just a reminder about some of the main dating techniques in deep time. These are not all of them, it's just a few. So the, the first is argon-argon dating. Um, there's a really great uh, review paper that was in GSA Bolton a couple of years ago by Shane et al. that goes into a lot of detail. Um, but the key things are, this is usually applied to things like sanidine or biotite from volcanoclastic or uh, um, volcanic layers. Um, and the way we get meaningful ages is that we calculate plateau ages um, from step heating of single or multiple crystals. But although it's a very precise technique, um, it relies on natural standards to calibrate your ages. And there are issues also with the de decay constant uh, that's used in these calculations as well. And so both of those things can affect the ages that are calculated. And the other thing is that there's a tradition in the argon-argon literature of, of, um, of reporting one sigma uncertainties, which people often miss um, because we're used to seeing two sigma uncertainties. So whenever you're comparing to dates of a different technique, you need to make sure the uncertainties are reported at the same sigma level. And so how does this affect things? Well, here are some argon-argon ages um, from the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary in Montana. And in red, are the revised ages and gray are the old ages. And you can see that some of these ages have changed significantly, particularly the one in the middle, the IRZ coal uh, labeled C, where the, a, the old age was after the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary and the revised age is before it. So that makes a huge difference, right? That's a mass extinction event. Um, and the reason why these ages have changed is nothing to do with the samples themselves, but rather correcting for a bias in the decay constant, as well as a revised age for the natural standard that was used to calibrate the date. So these are all things you need to pay attention to when you see ages in the literature. You cannot simply take them at face value because they may or may not have been corrected for these things in the last few years. The other major technique that's really used in deep time is uranium lead zircon dating. It can be applied to other minerals like batalite, but zircon is um, the most common by far. Um, but there's three different uh, methods that are typically applied. One is laser ablation uh, ICPMS, which we can do here in the department. And this has some great advantages because it's rather inexpensive and fast. You can date a lot of crystals quickly. And it also is a spot analysis on the crystal, so it doesn't util use the entire crystal. But it's fairly low precision and it doesn't use any pretreatment. And I'll explain what that, that means in a moment. Another is SIMS or sometimes called shrimp. Um, and uh, this also is a spot analysis. It's a bit more expensive, but uh, also lacks pretreatment as fairly low precision. Um, and both of these are what we can call microbeam techniques. They, they use some sort of beam to ionize a small part of the crystal. In contrast, um, thermal ionization uh, mass spectrometry is um, much more expensive, unfortunately, and it analyzes the entire crystal, but it has a much higher precision and it uses pretreatment. And so there's pluses and minuses to each of these, but we have to keep them in mind also once when we have ages from these different techniques and we're interpreting them in a geologic context. So why is pretreatment important? Well. Uh, what it means is it's thermal annealing and chemical abrasion with hydrofluoric acid. Um, and what it does, why, why it's really important is that it reduces the effects of lead loss. So we all learn in like undergraduate geology that things like zircon are great because they are sort of like a little time capsule. Once they crystallize and they go through closure temperature, um, everything's sort of locked in. And so they form with, you know, uranium inside of them and no lead. And then so that any lead you, you observe um, with the mass spectrometer is, is a daughter product, right? Well, that's not really the case. Things are more complicated. First of all, there is some residual lead called common lead that can get trapped in the crystal during formation. And uh, it turns out that crystals are almost never completely closed systems after they form. And so lead can actually be lost from the crystal over time. And that results in an apparently younger age than the true crystallization age of the zircon. And so 
This is a picture uh, on top, you see a, a crystal, zircon crystal before it's been treated and on the bottom after it's been treated and you can see it looks like Swiss cheese. And what it, what's happened here is the treatment has removed zones of the crystal that have anomalously high uranium content. And how does this affect the ages? Well, here's a plot uh, from my colleague, Roland Mundell. And on the far right in yellow are untreated crystal ages. And you can see it's the spread of different ages. Um, but after pretreatment on the far left in black, you can see you get much more concordant and older ages. Um, and the key thing here is that currently this method is only really used with TIMS. It can be applied to other, uh, the other techniques, but it hasn't really been much um, by, by people yet. So um, currently it's really something that goes along with TIMS. The other important thing to remember here is that lead loss is unique to each crystal. So each crystal ex can experience a different degree of lead loss. It's not like it's a systematic bias that you can correct for in your data processing. Um, and so that's why pretreatment really is the only way to, um, to deal with this issue. Um, there's no sort of statistical magic um, in a way that you can, you can apply to, to get rid of lead loss um, with, with uh, things like ICPMS and SIMS. So we can see this problem with some examples here. So um, in red and in gray are ages from the same crystal from the same sample, because with ICPMS, uh, we, can, we just analyze a little spot. So we have most of that crystal remaining that we can then analyze via TIM. So on this plot, um, you can see the top crystal, the top bar is the same crystal for both methods, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this example, the age we got from ICPMS and TIMS is uh, overlapping. It's good. It, you know, there doesn't seem to be much difference because of lead loss. But that's not always the case. Here's an example from the same sequence where the ages are completely different. There's no overlap in uncertainty. And so this is a problem, even though these microbeam, microbeam techniques have higher uncertainty, it doesn't seem to be reflecting all the geological issues such as lead loss um, and allow us to extract basically the same age with an uncertainty using different methods. So that's a real problem. And this is from data, these are data that my colleagues and I have published, but you see it in other studies that have compared different techniques Sometimes you get overlapped using different techniques in the uncertainty, and sometimes you don't. And there's just no way to predict what's, what result you're gonna get. And so to show this a little in a little more detail, this is a single uh, tough sample that's been dated. And so again, these are crystals from the exact same level. Um, one set that's been uh, analyzed using TIMS and one using SIMS. Um, and hopefully you can see here that the probability distribution is quite a bit different. And um, the bars here are the individual crystal ages and then the curve is a probability density distribution. So the traditional approach when you have these individual crystal ages is to calculate a weighted mean from those crystal ages and then 95% confidence intervals. But if you do that as shown in yellow, even though these these crystals are from the same exact sample. The two different methods give you ages that do not overlap. They're separated even in uncertainty by several million years. And we have good reason to think because of this pretreatment that the TIMS ages are not only are they more precise, but they're likely to be more accurate. So how can we analyze these microbeam data and recover ages that um, overlap in uncertainty with the more accurate approach. So something that my colleague Roland Mundell and I proposed recently is, um, oh, and sorry, here are the, the calculated uh, means and uncertainties, apologies. So something we've done is uh, propose a different approach, which is to augment the uncertainty uh, by calculating median relative error of the individual crystals. And this really results in much larger uncertainty but in every sample we've tested, 
it reliably recovers uncertainties that overlap between multiple techniques. And so a lot of, and so you can see here now that the Sims age has a much higher uncertainty, but it does overlap. So it may be much less precise, but it is more accurate. We've now calculated a age that is more accurate for use in geologic interpretation. Um, and you can see visually, here's the uncertainty overlapping. So it sacrifices precision for improved accuracy, which a lot of people don't like, but I'm a scientist, so I'm after accuracy um, as much as possible. But I think it is important to remember that as a result, microbeam uncertainties in particular are an order of magnitude larger using this approach. But so far, it's the only approach we can find that will, that will reliably extract accurate ages from microbeam, microbeam data when compared to TIMS data. And this can also be applied to argon-argon dating as well. Um, and it's reflecting perhaps a more realistic uncertainty than simply the analytical precision um, of, of the method applied. So that's a lot of data analysis. What can we actually do with these, these sorts of data and um, calculated ages? Well, here's an example from the Triassic of Argentina. We've got a bunch of different ages from different stratigraphic levels in the basin and uh, different techniques. And we can utilize these new, newly calculated ages to um, calculate a Bayesian uh, age stratigraphic model that it gives us average depositional rate, identifies changes in depositional rate, things like that. Um, and it, it's great because it comes with its own propagated uncertainty. Um, and it's also really useful because it allows us to, with these age models, you can then identify discrepancies in the data or the basin. For example, these points up here are magnetostratigraphic tie points, but this is a uranium lead age um, and it falls off of the calculated age model. So this then gives us a hypothesis to investigate further with additional uh, sampling. Is, this, is there an issue with how these tie points were correlated or is there something wrong with the correlation of this dated level within the basin or something else going on? So, um, now we need to go back and actually do some field work and additional analysis to figure out what's going on here to try and resolve this discrepancy in the model. But it also means that even fairly large uh, ages with fairly large uncertainties can uh, provide meaningful data for calculating an age model for the sequence you're interested in. Um, Here's a couple of other examples of those similar age models, but in these cases, the data are only microbean data. And it goes to show that um, microbean data are great for a lot of things, but if you're interested in precise age constraints for depositional ages, they're, they're going to be of limited use because in all of these models, the uncertainties are plus or minus five to 10 million years. Um, and that is the case even when you have quite a few ages from different levels in the basin. Um, so if you just take, for example, this level is just one I randomly picked, it spans three different stages of the Triassic um, in terms of uncertainty. But that shouldn't, be, um, that shouldn't be sort of a reason not to use microbean techniques. They're really great if you want a large inventory or you want to um, figure out whether certain samples are going to be useful as depositional age constraints, and then you can go back and target them using TIMS. So far for, you know, although there's much larger uncertainty, it allows you to, you know, generate hypotheses and evaluate the appropriateness of your sample, and then you can date them with more precise <laughs> techniques later. And so if you want to learn more, um, we talked about a lot of this, including the new um, age uh, uncertainty calculation technique in a recent paper in the Journal of South American Earth Sciences that, uh, that you're welcome to check out. And I'm happy to send anyone a PDF as well. So, so that's a lot of um, sort of details on geochronology. Um, I wanted to give then an example of how this plays out um, in, in an actual study that relates back to ecosystem change in deep time. So that is uh, a work that we've been doing in Petro, oops, uh-oh. 
Um, let's see if it comes back, hopefully. Man, the, the, the projector must be touchy about the Triassic. I'm not sure what's going on. So um, this is work that we did in Petrified Forest National Park, um, which is in Northeastern Arizona. And um, back in the Triassic, it was in near equatorial paleo latitudes. Um, and there's been a ton of work geologically and paleontologically over the past century in this park, in the Chinle Formation, which is late Triassic in age. Um, and one of the things people observe first with vertebrate animals, animals with backbones, is that about midway through the formation, there was a change in the species that were present. And it looked pretty sudden, sudden at least stratigraphically. Um, and this change subsequently was also observed in records of plants as well. So this, these are pollen diagrams, but they observed it in leaf fossils as well. So it seems like there's some things happening in the middle part of the formation where you get a change in the um, type of species present and uh, the abundance of those species. So naturally the question has been, what is the cause of this? Well, this is uh, a strat idealized stratigraphic column showing the outcrop stratigraphy. And we had some outcrop uranium lead ages that suggested it was somewhere, this, this change in the fossils was somewhere between 217 and 214 million years old. And we know from other uh, uranium lead and argon argon dating that a big rock hit the earth right about that time. So in Quebec, Canada is the Manicouagan impact structure. It's really cool because uh, part of the crater is filled by a lake. So you can really see it nicely from space. And that's dated to 215.5 million years old. But of course, there's, you know, say 215.5 million years old is very different than saying something happened between 217 and 214 million years old. How can we actually test whether this might be the cause of this biotic change? Well, uh, our way of going about it was to go drill a continuous rock core because this way you have unambiguous superposition of all your samples. They're a single column of rock from one place and it's unweathered rock, and you can do all sorts of cool things with that core, including radioisotopic dating, magnetostratigraphy, uh, stable isotope analysis, many, many other things. So uh, with the support of NSF and International Continental Drilling Program, uh, we drilled the core in 2013. Um, and um, I don't have time to go into all the specifics, but um, this today we're going to just focus particularly on uranium lead dating. And I want to emphasize that this was work that was led by my former PhD student, uh, Connie Rasmussen, who's now a research scientist at UTIG at University of Texas, Austin. Um, so she, Connie produced an amazing data set of uranium lead ages from throughout the Chinle formation in the course, uh, spanning several hundred meters of section. And what we, here's, I'm blowing up some of the examples. Again, gray is uh, microbeam data that was used to survey a large number of crystals before we then did TIMS on a subset of the youngest of crystals. And what you can see is that the data, the individual ages vary in how easy it is to interpret them. Up top, we have something that has a very coherent single age population, but below we have things that are not coherent, just a spread of different ages because it's, these are largely redeposited. They're not air fall tufts. And then you get things that are really difficult to interpret where there's closely spaced ages, but they still have this smear. There's not a lot, you know, really distinct pop age populations. Um, but we, we were able to, um, to sort of very carefully calculate conservative ages from these different types of results. And Connie uh, generated this uh, Bayesian age model. Um, and you can see that Overall, there's sort of a similar depositional rate, uh, average depositional rate, but there's something funky going on in the middle of the section here, um, whether it's non-deposition or just a slowdown in deposition. Um, those are two possibilities. The other thing that we observed was that although in the upper part of the core, we had very good agreement with uh, previously published ages from outcrop, which are in black and gray. In the lower part of the core, there was a lot lot less agreement with our ages being younger. And um, we think that's probably because 
we were surveying hundreds of crystals from each sample using microbeam techniques first to identify the youngest age populations, whereas those previous studies just dated a dozen or so crystals that using TIMS that looked good. So they probably weren't finding the youngest crystals um, in, in their sample. And we also did magnetostratigraphy. Um, and so combining the magnetostratigraphy and uranium lead ages led us to two different integrated age models. The first one, if you take the one-to-one -one, uh, magnetostratigraphic correlation at face value, um, suggests a relatively simple age model, but there's a discrepancy here where uh, it suggests some of the uranium lead ages are older than the depositional age in the middle part of the core. But that's just one interpretation. Another possibility is that the uranium lead ages here are much closer to the true depositional age. And because there might be um, a zone here of slow or no, no deposition, um, that maybe there's a magnetocron that's missing from, that's not preserved in the core, um, but is pres preserved elsewhere on Earth. Um, and the uranium lead ages are giving us good information. So some members of our team really pushed for us to select one age model and go for it. But both of these age models basically make the same number of assumptions in the complexity of the data. So I, you, I don't think you can pick from them without additional evidence. So we went ahead and published both as equal equally likely possibilities. And I hope to show you in the next couple of slides how um, even though the, we have these two different age models, it still allowed us to come to some pretty good conclusions about whether this biotic change was caused by this large uh, bolide impact. So here's uh, the fossil ranges of some different animals. It doesn't really matter which ones they are, but I've plotted here the level of the biotic change. Um, and the y-axis is stratigraphy in meters. So just based on a literal reading of the geologic record, um, we had some evidence this happened between 214 and 217 million years old. And it looked like it was a relatively sudden change in, in species in the fossil record, perhaps caused by this impact event. Well, we can now calibrate this based on the different age models. So looking at age model one, what we see is that it suggests, again, a relatively rapid biotic change here, but it is too young to be uh, kept associated with the manicoagulant impact. It's about a million years too young. <laughs> so based on age model one, it suggests that this was a sudden biotic change, but it wasn't caused by a bolide impact. What about age model two? Well, it looks a bit different here. And now there's a bigger sort of gap here suggesting perhaps a more protracted change, um, although it's hard to say. But again, it's still too young. So it's after 215 million years ago. And so while this might suggest a more gradual change in the ecosystem, it still doesn't appear to be caused by the manicoagulant impact. And so even though we had this uncertainty in these conflicting age models, they both were precise enough that allowed us to, and allows us to rule out uh, this giant meteorite impact as the, or asteroid impact as the cause of this change in the species that we observe in the fossil record at petrified forests. So sort of sum up um, this part of the talk, um, I think it's important to always remember when you see an age with uncertainty, Analytical precision is not the same as geological accuracy. Um, and um, we've presented one possible approach to calculate uncertainties to extract accurate ages from these different dating techniques that, um, that seem to have uh, different, not only different levels of precision, but also different levels of accuracy based on things like natural standards, lead loss, et cetera. Um, and I think, you know, we're not the only people to say this, but these sort of integrated Bayesian um, age stratigraphic models are a real powerful approach to extracting inferences about Earth history um, from the stratigraphic record. 
Um, and particularly for my work, you know, when we're dealing with fossils and the paleo environmental record associated with them. So with a little bit of time left, the second thing I wanna talk about um, is uh, something to do with uh, inferring atmospheric carbon dioxide through time. And I'm a bit embarrassed to be talking about this because some of the introductory stuff is, is stuff that Terry Serling in the front row figured out here. So I'm oversimplifying, no doubt, I apologize. But I did want to present sort of the basis of the method. Um, so this is a graph of um, different proxies for PCO2 through time over the last 300 million years. Um, and obvious reason we're interested in this, among many other things, is that um, depending on what we do with greenhouse gases, we might be going towards sort of the Paleogene or the Mesozoic in carbon dioxide levels in the next century. Uh, the, the purple bar here is at 400, where we're approximately at now. So, so how do we actually estimate these, these um, values in deep time? There's a number of different methods and uh, Gabe actually has a big grant right now to improve some of the estimations of these proxies. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about today is paleosol carbonates, the, the delta C13 value of paleosol carbonates. So that is specifically these carbonate nodules that form in soils. So just a reminder that soils have different horizons. Here's a, a modern soil that I've, I've sort of lined up with the diagram. Um, and we're really interested in the B horizon because that's where most of these carbonate nodules form in the soil. Um, and just a note that often in paleosols, the A horizon is not preserved. It gets eroded away or it gets developed into a horizon of, of the successive soil above it. Um, but the good news is the B horizon is very often preserved. And so it's a great place that we can sample. So why does this happen? Well, it's a, it's a bit of a complicated process, but the key parts are that you have evapotranspiration happening with the soil with a, a concentration of calcium ions at depth and also carbon in the soils. And that carbon is a combination of carbon from the atmosphere as well as carbon from organic matter. And there's a number of fractionation effects that occur here. Um, as I said, I am oversimplifying. <laughs> but one of the one of the really cool things is that uh, Turi and Jay Quaid and others, it, they instrumented a number of modern soils and they observed that although as you go down the depth profile, there is a change in the concentration of carbon dioxide, it eventually reaches at depth something close to equilibrium. So if you know the offset be, of this between the air and at depth, um, then you know that the, there is some relationship to what you're measuring at depth to the atmosphere. Um, and the great thing is that, that not only, there's not only that relationship for concentration of carbon dioxide, but also for the isotopic value of the carbonates that are forming at depth here. Um, and so if you go to modern soils like uh, Turi and others have, and you sample a depth profile through the soil, what you see is that the isotopic value changes um, in the upper part of the soil, but it starts to get close to an equilibrium here at, at depth. Um, and so if you can measure these, the isotopic values of, um, of carbonate nodules or carbonate from soils at depth here, you can then relate that um, to the atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide levels and calculate an estimate of PCO2 in the past. And I, I didn't put the, the, um, the equations up here, but um, you can see Cherry's papers for more details. So, um, so this is great because this potentially allows us in paleosols, in ancient soils, to measure the isotopic values of these carbonates. And then um, we also need to measure the isotopic value of organic matter. And with those two um, key things, we can then um, estimate um, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, in the past, which is awesome. So as I mentioned earlier, often we've got the A horizon has been removed from erosion, uh, paleo erosion, um, but we do get uh, carbonate 
accumulation in the B horizon here. So Turi and others have been very careful about how they apply this proxy in, into paleosols, but not everybody has. And so a, lo a lot of studies you read applying this proxy, they just measure down from the top of the soil and then you know, pluck out a carbonate nodule or two and say, okay, we're deep enough. We've got a carbonate, couple of carbonate nodules. We'll measure those and calculate PCO2 from that. So is it that easy? Well, I'm not so sure. So um, this is what we hope to observe, right? Is that if we just measure down deep enough here, uh, we, will, um, we will sample carbonates that are at equilibrium. And you know, the A horizon may or may not be preserved here. Um, but there's not been a huge number of studies that publish soil profiles from ancient, from really deep time paleosols, but the few that have see a lot more complicated um, records. So this is just one example and it looks really complicated. So I'll just outline a couple of things. First of all, um, those solid lines are the predicted model for isotopic value of these carbonates. And then each one of those spaghetti string lines is an individual different soil profile. And I've highlighted just a few here. And what you can see is, you know, the couple on the left look okay, right? They seem to be reaching equilibrium at depth, but at different depths, right? Maybe you can't assume the same depth for equilibrium across soils. But others, like the ones on the right, are very squiggly. You know, one of them even sort of turns back on itself in values here. Um, so can we really assume that if we just take a point sample at depth that it's representing the isotopic value at equilibrium? Maybe not. Um, and these are, these, each of these dots are just individual analyses. So um, that's one, one carbonate nodule per, per, per level within the soil profile. So why did I get interested in this? I'm not a geochemist or a paleopodologist. So I'm sure I'm making lots of mistakes here, which uh, Terry can correct me on. But we wanted to calculate PCO2 for the Chinle formation, this Triassic unit that uh, I work in in Utah and other places. And you can see here in Bears Ears National Monument in an area called Indian Creek, there's these beautiful stacked calcic paleosols that are seem perfect for um, sampling for isotopic analysis and calculate, make, estimating PCO2. And this is work that's been led by undergraduate student researcher Aidan Bokema here in the department and uh, has done a phenomenal job. And as you'll see, a huge number of analyses and um, sample preparation work to, to do this. So, so what we did was we wanted to really understand what's going on here isotopically. So we trenched um, continuously through these soils taking samples at 10 centimeter intervals. Um, and we didn't just analyze one nodule per uh, 10 centimeter interval, we analyzed three to five nodules um, to try and understand what sort of variation there might be at each level, as well as through the profile of the soil. And well, um, here's what we get. So on the left is uh, the individual data points, and then on the right is a mean with standard deviation. And what you can see is that um, there's quite a bit of variation in the isotopic values at any one, uh, any one horizon within the soil profile, as well as um, going down section. And, you know, you could maybe draw a vertical line through this, maybe not. Um, but there's, you know, if we had gone and just taken one soil sample depth, would we really be reflecting what's equilibrium? Um, and this is a soil, this has a fewer data points, but again, you can see in this soil profile, there's more, there's um, still quite a bit of variation. Um, and um, this one is perhaps the closest, if you're looking at just the means closest to what is predicted in that you get slightly uh, heavier values here, and then something close to a vertical equilibrium here, but still there's quite a bit of variation here. And we've done um, thin sections of the nodules to ensure that we're sampling a micrite as opposed to sort of recrystallized spar and things like that. So we tried to rule that out as much as possible. 
Um, there could be other things that are playing into this variation, particularly some of these outliers here. But I think there are implications to be learned here in the sense that um, you, it's probably not advisable just to measure down from the top of the B horizon and take a point sample at you know, X centimeters depth and say, okay, I've sampled deep enough to calculate PCO2. Um, and even if you take individual samples from throughout the soil profile, they may or may not reflect sort of the mean values at equilibrium. And why does this all matter? Well, it's, it, it happens to be when you get to calculating uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. So assume making some assumptions about uh, holding other values constant, a 1.5 per mil difference in the isotopic value of these carbonates is almost a thousand parts per million difference in the PCO2 value. So that's, that's the difference between being here in the present and being somewhere in the Mesozoic in terms of amount of difference that you're calculating. And, you know, we should, I should definitely qualify by saying that this is just several paleosols from one site, but um, it does suggest that there's a lot more uncertainty and variation in these paleosol records that we need to contend with if we're going to robustly estimate PCO2 from, the, from deep time um, from these paleosol records. So uh, just to sum up, there seems to be uh, quite a bit more variation than has always been appreciated by at least some folks. I'm sure Turi appreciates it um, or has appreciated that variation. But um, I definitely seems like point sampling um, in a paleosol is probably not the way to go, regardless of any things that might be specific to our study site here. And I think the the way forward might be to try and do more depth profiling in the isotopic values and combine it with modeling techniques like those that Gabe and his uh, students have developed to extract more meaningful estimates in deep time of PCO2. So with that, I'll say thank you to everyone and happy to take questions. Randy, if you handle your own questions, I'll keep it up. Oh, okay, that would be good.